Good afternoon to you. Mark Suttoth, HurricaneTrack.com here Monday now, the 27th of May, 2024. It is Memorial Day 2024. Good to have you with me for the hurricane outlook and discussion. As you can tell from my background, I'm back from the Southern Plains after several days working with Greg Nordstrom and my colleague from Colorado, Matt Clemens, as we were out on our quest looking for big hail. We'll talk about that at the end of today's update in the severe weather part of this. Speaking of topics, I guess, we'll talk about tropical waves. We'll take a look at what is happening with the developing La Nina. And then, yes, we're going to address this severe weather situation. It is just out of control, really, since the end of April now for the last month. Wow, just jaw-dropping what we have seen. Fatalities, lots of damage, uh, severe weather, tornadoes especially, are back in 2024. So we'll take a look at all of that. And again, thanks for tuning in. I do appreciate you having you with me here on this fine Monday afternoon, at least where I am. First of all, the good news here, not much happening at all in the Atlantic Basin, which we wouldn't expect that there would be at the end of May. It can happen, but it's not happening right now. And we don't have anything in the eastern Pacific, so that's good. Satellite perspective of everything, I guess let's use a fine color of blue to make everything stand out fairly well. Finally, just real quick about severe weather, a little bit of a break here in the nation's midsection, but the energy is over here in the eastern U.S., and we saw a lot of severe weather yesterday. Again, we'll look at that in more detail later. But down here in the tropics, strong upper-level winds, very easy to spot by just looking at the cloud tracers, so to speak. Brisk trade winds coming in at the surface, blowing through the islands of the eastern Caribbean. And there is a tropical wave in here. We'll take a look at that in more detail in just a second through a nice uh, couple of graphics from the tropical analysis and forecast branch a couple of areas of deep thunderstorms or convection in the eastern pacific but nothing really going on to be of any to, you know, posing any concern from the tropics right now so tropical waves yep they are first of all the best way to describe these pieces of energy that move off the coast of africa Sometimes they get their origins all the way over in the Ethiopian highlands. And just think of these as areas where the air is coming together, it's converging, and it's just a little bit of a like a trough. But instead of, you know, usually we think of troughs as dipping down like this, these are more inverted troughs. And you have a focusing mechanism where the air is coming together, so you get rising motion, you get showers and thunderstorms, and some of these waves can be very long covering a huge distance, some of them can be shorter and less energetic, but they're these impulses that go across the Atlantic Basin about a hundred or so a year, and on average maybe six, seven, eight, nine, ten, something like that, go on to develop into tropical cyclones. Uh, but they are these seedlings, and you can see there's one right there. This is a, the map from the Tropical Analysis and Forecast Branch down in Miami. There is another tropical wave there. And then a third one here in the Caribbean Sea. And this is probably just a surface trough right here. This is a good map that people use when they want to know ocean and marine conditions. And uh, this is also a nice way to see the monsoon trough and the intertropical convergent zone. Uh, the ITCZ down here, fairly low latitude. This will move north over time. And these tropical waves will get more and more robust. And then when we get a favorable, let's use green to make it look like Ben Knowles maps, when we get a favorable Madden Julian oscillation that passes through here and then eventually makes its way over towards Africa, green usually means upward motion, uh, and we get the big standing wave of upward motion, then these tropical waves have a chance to develop. But right now, they are just these packets of energy and they come across and uh, they can bring some showers and thunderstorms and gusty winds and heavy downpours and that can create flooding. So here's this post from Tropical Analysis Forecast Branch. A robust tropical wave is moving westward across the central and westward Caribbean Sea. It will cause gusty winds, strong thunderstorms, and locally heavy downpours there. Remember, rain is an impact. For the next few days, more interest, more interest, slow down, Mark, marine interests in the area need to stay safe and plan accordingly. Good infographic here. Lots of wonderful stuff out on the internet. You just got to know where to find it. And this could be very helpful, especially people on those nice big sailing vessels down there, yachts and big catamarans or whatever. The billionaires, right? And the millionaires. 
you got to be careful down there, and this kind of information does help you to plan for that if you are a mariner uh, traveling on a billionaire yacht or a billion-dollar-plus tanker or whatever. You get the idea. So our friends at TAFB, TAFB, do a fine job of keeping track of that. But eventually, these systems will come in, and they'll focus, and then we'll get something to develop. But that's down the road a piece. I don't see that happening anytime soon. But just wanted you to be aware of it. We will look at these graphics and stuff from TAFB fairly often. All right, next topic, the developing La Nina. Again, it's not officially a La Nina just yet, but it is coming on. And you can see the equatorial Pacific here definitely starting to cool off our Nino regions. Absolutely. And we even have some very cold anomalies over here in the far eastern Pacific. And notice, too, this is curious, very cold water relative to average, butting right up against the west coast of North America all the way down to the Baja. Some warm anomalies here in the extreme eastern Pacific. This is going to be about the only breeding ground suitable for tropical cyclone activity this year. And as this La Nina gets going, we'll have more stable air across this region, less rising motion, more, uh, more of the rising motion will happen over here. So this will be positive, this will be negative for Pacific development, and on and on it goes. So we'll watch this as this strengthens over time, helping to make the Atlantic more favorable. And we can see that on the subsurface as well. If you took a slice through what I just showed you, this is what it looks like. All that cold water relative to average down below the surface, or what we call the subsurface, obviously, and some pretty strong anomalies at, at, at that, several degrees Celsius below the average. And uh, this goes back several weeks. So, yep, the La Nina is on its way. Just a, probably a couple more months, and it'll officially be here, or however they designate it. Different agencies, like the Bureau of Meteorology in Australia has a definition and a different way of looking at it versus the Climate Prediction Center in the U.S. Bottom line, though, when we see that all through there, we know it's coming. So another way to watch all this is from the Southern Oscillation Index. And uh, very easy to explain this one. These numbers are generally positive, especially strongly so. And we've seen the trend here is up, up, up. Uh, then that's more supportive of a La Nina situation because you have stronger easterly winds blowing across this area. And that's what you need. You need those easterlies to just keep on going. And when they are anomalously strong, you help to upwell that cold water that's at the surface and you spread that cold water out and uh, you get to your La Nina. And when these numbers here are strongly negative, like we saw last year, we get the El Nino, the reverse. So once May comes to an end, the 30 day number will be one point something, maybe close to two. Uh, we only have a few days left. So I think this will probably pop above um, the zero line. And it's just an index like the stock market. You know, it's just a, an average of numbers and whatnot. Because you notice April was minus 6, and uh, so May will end up in the positive territory. Further evidence that we are headed towards La Nina. All right, one more thing related to this. How can we make this pop the best? Lots of colors in there. Um, I guess we'll use green. That'll contrast the best. What are we looking at here? This is your. These are your lines of longitude down here. So this is 60 west, 180 uh, the dateline, and we are most interested really in about this area right through here. And we can see this is our Hovmuller diagram. And the winds, I look at this and I go, oh, nothing but easterly winds out into the future. So this is where we uh, are coming from. This is the forecast. This is the future. And all those blues and purples in here, that is anomalous easterly winds, so winds that are going this way, east to west, uh, all across this area. And then in the Atlantic, mm, the trade's not so strong. They're very minuscule and even have some yellows speckled in there. But this is your dense area of entrenched easterly winds in the deep tropics, and that helps to foster the La Nina as well. So there you go. All right. Um, yeah, the severe weather, seriously, out of control ever since the end of April. This shot from Saturday night where that supercell went across I-35 um, was just terrifying. You've seen the videos, I'm sure. Drove through there yesterday with my colleague Matt 
um, just near Sanger. Sanger, is that how you say it? Hopefully. And um, boy, the damage, you could see it. And all the rescue people were still there. It's just been out of control. It really has. We had the tornado in Marietta back in April. Sulfur, uh, you've seen it. And then yesterday up in uh, parts of Kentucky. So this just goes to show sort of a little bit of a commentary here. Look, we have to stay on top of this kind of stuff. These videos that we keep seeing of people accidentally driving into the paths of tornadoes, especially at night, I mean, your phone, hopefully you've got this with you at all times. It seems like everybody does. Keep those emergency alert messages on. You know, they might be annoying or whatever. I'm sorry, but I think that's much better for you to be annoyed than for your family to have to plan a funeral for you. You know, we have got to be more cognizant. Just focus a little bit. Hey, what's the weather going to do today? Am I in a severe risk area? And if so, I guess I better pay more attention. And then just make sure this thing is on. And if you've got a friend that's a real true weather geek, like somebody that's watching these videos, right? Maybe ask them, hey, so-and-so, could you keep me up to date? I really don't know that much about weather, or I'm really busy today. And then there's people that will jump at that opportunity these armchair meteorologists, and that's a good thing, all right? That is a great term. Somebody that didn't go to school for it, but they really like watching it. I mean, there's people that watch NFL football or hockey or basketball or baseball that are just diehard fans and they know everything about the sport, but they can never play it, and that's okay. Same thing with this. Uh, rely on the people that do know, and let's cut down on this. You know, the, these deaths here, that really, I was telling my friend um, Scott, well, he has a friend, Scott, um, talking with Matt about this, that it hurts. It does. It's like we hate to see that. And beyond that, you know, we just got to build better, I guess. Uh, what are you going to do against a 200 mile an hour tornado? But that's a story for another day, I guess. But yeah, it's been really, really busy. And we get all this info from the Storm Prediction Center. They've had a busy time of it really since the end of April. And just to kind of show you here, I want you to focus right over here. Let's use red to point this out. I'm going to be moving this map through using all of these little buttons right here and just watch what happens this is at the end of april this is the 24th this is right around the time that i went out there with our other colleague cj but look at these reports as they just start coming in the reds are your tornadoes all right very busy there at the end of april kind of died down just a little and then it popped right back up again look at all of that it's just been day after day after day now we're up into May. May 6 was just terrible again. Oklahoma, I mean, really, it's out there in the Midwest and the Southern Plains, and then it shifted up into the you know, south of the Great Lakes region, and then something uh, on May 8th there, down in the deeper parts of the southeast United States, and then even further south from there, and it just on and on it went, a couple quietish days, but then it really ramped up again as we got towards the end of the month here. You know, a little bit of a quiet spell, but then the 19th, more and then more after that on the 20th and you see where i'm going with this it has absolutely been crazy busy your eyes are not deceiving you and uh, those are all the wind reports lots and lots of wind reports and just a few things here remember the big derecho that went through the houston area they certainly do yeah so we've had a lot of issues here with severe weather as we approach and of course this is just today it's just getting started but as we approach the hurricane, sen the hurricane season, it's got to slow down a little bit. It just kind of reminds me to remind you, at least with hurricanes, we have days in advance warning. Some of these tornadoes, we have minutes, maybe even seconds in some cases, depending on where you are. But just asking, you know, just a little bit more effort. It's your responsibility. You know this information is out there. Look it up. Stay on top of it. And hopefully we'll keep yourself safe, all right, especially as we get into what is forecast to be a very busy hurricane season. So speaking of severe weather, just kind of wrapping things up on this, I had to come back home. I can't just live out on the Great Plains, but you know, I've got a family and I enjoy spending time with them, absolutely. But the risk today for some hail, probably the highest over here. However, a slight risk over a very large area of the east. So just be on top of it, just be aware. And uh, the tornado threat, low but not zero, as they say. And the wind damage, that wind from these things, man, the downbursts and just the big outflow gust and whatnot, you got to just, I mean, I, make sure you're indoors or get those tents tucked in or whatever. And then the hail threat, 
really the highest here because it's hatched in parts of Texas. And of course, now that I'm home, there'll probably be multiple reports of giant hail. That's just how that works. Uh, tomorrow, back over here in Texas. And yes, again, but it's okay. I'll talk about what we're going to do next in just a minute. And then on day three, it starts to shift to down near the border area near Mexico and um, western Texas and uh, parts of the high plains and southern plains, northeast Colorado, whatnot. And then days four through eight, thank goodness, nothing is triggering the system, whatever it is. The people, the algorithms, nothing showing up as we move out into time. So that's good. So uh, ending on just a real quick note about our hail project. Um, spent a lot of time going after it. And we've learned quite a few things. And I'm going to do a whole separate video about this tomorrow. Uh, and I want to update our patrons because those are, the one, those are the ones that are helping to fund this. And then I'll make that public as well. But looking for very large hail is a lot harder than I thought. That's the first thing that we've learned. But it's also because things are a little bit different this year. Last year there was much more of it. And even people with the IBHS program, Dr. Ian Giamanco and his team, are not finding the dense hail and the big hail that they've been looking for for part of their studies. They've got these roof panels they're wanting to put out and these distrometers that can get impact data. And it's just been a tough year, which is good. Yes, there's been large hail, of course, but finding the exact supercell to be in to get that has been a lot harder than I thought it would be. And I was reading some reports from Dr. Giamanco, and it turns out that's also what they're observing as well. But once we get into June and even into July, we start to shift the focus to the Front Range, you know, Colorado, Wyoming, the High Plains, Nebraska, and points north, and maybe, I do have a passport, maybe even into southern Canada. Yes, they have hail in Canada. It doesn't stop at the border. So we're going to continue to work towards that. We've got a lot of new ideas. We've learned a lot of stuff about how to do what we do, and that's the main point of year one is to just learn and figure things out and be ready for this to be a multi-year project where we eventually get our own distrometers that measures the impacts I and mean, where we really get into the science of it. So anyway, it's been an interesting project. We're going to continue with it as we get into June. And for those of you that are following that line of work, we do have a Hail Project podcast. I'll be adding a couple of new episodes related to that in the coming weeks. And then it'll be hurricane season, and we'll be focusing on that very much as well. All right? I think I covered everything. You all have a great, let me get out of here, drop me out. You have a great rest of your Monday. As always, thank you for giving me a part of your day. I hope you learned something. I'm Mark Suttles from all of us at Hurricane Track. Good to have you. I'll uh, see you again tomorrow.